All right, Richard. So thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, I had mentioned before that Todd Armstrong, who I'd met through someone else, had introduced us. Um, I didn't realize you were in, an, in Hawaii. So this is a, well, it's not an international episode because Hawaii is the United States, but it's a, it's a, where you're like on the other side of the world. You said it's what? It's 3.30 here. So it must be in the morning sometime there? 9.30 in the morning. Okay. So I don't know if that's early for you, but. Uh, no, I, I get up at 4.30. So it's oh, almost good. lunchtime. I think, I don't think I'd get up at 4.30, but maybe if I lived in Hawaii, I could. You know, well, you live the reason in paradise. you might get up at 4.30 if you lived in Hawaii is we go to bed at 8. Because of why? Because the sun or the way things no, are there? there's not really anything to do after 8. But yeah. Oh. Um, it is dark by 8. As yeah, but it's to... probably a healthier lifestyle, you know, to go to bed earlier and get up earlier. Probably a healthier well, it's lifestyle. more productive, right? Because we tend to be more productive in the morning maybe than... than at night and right so what do we do at night but watch tv and eat and generally um so we cut some of that out by going to bed early and then right. we're up early so we get a lot more done maybe i don't know but yeah no watching tv late at night so i want to if we could tell your story and i want to get into all the things you're doing now and the business you've owned but maybe you can start with like where you're from where you grew up how you ended up in hawaii i'm interested to hear that um, and then we could talk about your books and all the motivational stuff you do and coaching, things like that. Sure. Well, I'm from California. I was born and raised there in central California. Most okay. people think of California as LA, but about five hours north of LA, three hours east of San Francisco in the foothills below Yosemite National Park on nice. a cattle ranch. Oh, okay. And um, so I grew up, you know, kind of alone because this big cattle ranch so i didn't socialize a lot as a kid i didn't do well in school at all in fact no. i cheated to get out of high school <laughs> i never went i never went to college okay. and in that part of the country if you don't have a college degree you either you end up generally back s somewhere in agriculture either back on the dairy or the farm or the ranch or you right. end up in food processing okay i ended up in food processing working in a chicken plant called Foster Farms. Okay. And I worked there for four years and I absolutely loved it. And I planned on spending the rest of my life there. <clears throat> so what do you have to do? Like raise the chickens, feed the chickens, slaughter the chickens, do all that stuff? And this was the processing plant. So the chickens <clears throat> were already dead and they were oh, already okay. plucked. And so what we did is cut them up into parts. Oh, okay. And you're packaging them and... Whatever. Yeah, it was the packaging plant. Got it. And I would have just retired from Foster Farms a couple of years ago, except they created a policy company-wide that said you couldn't advance any further in the company unless you had a four-year degree. Ah. And they've since abandoned that policy a long time ago, but it basically caused me to look elsewhere. And I wasn't looking for business. I I didn't have any business background. I Right. You know, my parents weren't, they were cattle ranchers, but that's a business, but you know, it's not a typical business, different kind of entrepreneurial business, business right. really. Yeah. So, but I had a friend that kept calling me and saying, Hey, come and look at this, come and look at this business. And so I looked and I didn't really like the business. I didn't like the idea of the business of this you person's know, I, business. It was a, uh, basically a direct selling business. Oh, okay. And what, um, how old were you at this point? 22. Okay. Young. Okay. Yep. So what I didn't like about it was I didn't like the idea of selling and I didn't like the, I see the idea of wearing a suit and going out and talking to people I didn't know. And I didn't right. like any of that. Well, it wasn't the world you grew up with, right? No, it's totally yeah. different from where <laughs> I grew up. What I did like was the people in the business were nurturing they were enthusiastic they were positive they were interested in me okay and in maybe a very casual way they were willing to coach me and i okay. never really had that in my life my parents really didn't provide that school i didn't allow to provide that right the chicken the chicken plant didn't provide that well the chickens are so, dead so they weren't going to motivate yeah. you too much so what what attracted me to the enterprise were the people. And 
so I dove in and, you know, I struggled mightily for two and a half years. I, right. I sold well, What everything. were you selling? You said door to door type of stuff? Well, I wasn't really door to door. It was more no? person to person. It was a gasoline additive. Um, oh. You put it in your gas tank every time you fill it up. A phenomenal product. I still use it today. Oh, 45 really? years later, I use it. It extends in... the life of the engine, basically? Yeah. 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 Okay. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, anyway, I struggled for about three years. And then I kind of really discovered personal development and dove into that. And I became a different person. And that different person then had the ability to relate to people better. Mm -hmm. And then I became very successful. And that particular kind of direct sales is known today as network marketing or multi-level marketing, or some people call it the pyramid thing. Yeah, but that was um, the early days of network marketing, basically. It was. Yeah. And, you know, the reason I became so successful is that model, if you're successful with people, a motivator, a leader, a speaker, a coach, right. a salesperson, you can end up growing a sales force exponentially. So sure. by the time I was 28 years old, I had 30,000 people on my sales team. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, the just rest takes is, time and doing it, right? Yeah. It's like anything else that you got to learn it and then you got to do it and you got to, you got to do it long enough for it to pay off. Right. Well, I think that's a lot of things people are like, I tried it. It didn't work You for two weeks. Like, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't things don't work that way. Well, so yeah, anything you try doesn't work. Right. Um, you know, if you, if you tried to be a realtor, <laughs> that's not going to work either. Right. So, right. Uh, you know, the thing that creates so much failure in network marketing is there's no barrier to entry. Right. Anybody can become a network marketer tomorrow for $20 and there's no penalty for lack of performance. Right. You, you can just get, sit there and not do anything. Yeah. You don't get fired and you don't even really get criticized. So, right. Well, I would think yeah. out of the 30,000 people you had, you had must have groups of people that were more active and groups of people that were less active, right? Yeah, like 80-20, 20% 20 of the 30,000. Drove 80% of the revenue, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, but you're still pretty young at this point, right? You're mid to late 20s? Yeah, 28. Yeah, okay. And you're still in Northern California at this point? No, I'd actually, in that uh, six years, I'd lived in um, Arizona, Texas, Iowa, Illinois, Florida, and Oklahoma. I moved all over the United States developing and nurturing that sales team so you would like um, live in different places and grow the sales team and then move and yep you didn't have okay i was, I was single so that was easy yeah so do. you didn't have any kids or anything to worry about it was yep. easy to move i'm curious to see how you end up in hawaii but we'll, i guess we'll get to that well I'll, I'll just fast forward i then i uh that particular company that i was a sales rep in i then ran for three years okay they they drafted me to run it um right and I found that I had a knack for business, for, for people, for revenue, for investments, for, you know, kind of knowing what needed to be done to drive revenue. And so then I went from that opportunity to buying a really lousy, virtually bankrupt company. Right. And I spent the next 30 years, 35 years building that company uh, into an extraordinary business. And then, you know, other businesses came along with that and writing books came along with that and coaching people came along with that. And Right. When you're successful, people want to learn from you. Now, what did that company do when you had for 30 years? Dental care. I still own it. Uh, okay. Dental care, boutique dental care pet care and nutrition. So consider it to be high-end niche market boutique products that are uh, used by perhaps high-end cosmetic dentists, uh, high-end mm -hmm. veterinarians and groomers. And then on the nutrition side, uh, personal trainers, nutritionists, naturopaths, chiropractors. Got it. So more of a B2B attractive. type of a business. You're really selling to the 
the business owner and he's using it for his patients or customers? We do both. We sell direct to consumers. Oh, and you do? We sell direct to professionals. Now, what, I mean, I'm jumping around here, but so you were, you were working, so you were, you grew up in the cattle business and the ranching business and you went from chickens. It's, it's kind of funny if you think about it, but it does show your, it does show your breadth of, of business acumen, right? Because a lot of people do well in a business, like they get into some industry and they figured it out. And then, like you said, the time comes, they go to another business and they fail because they, their skills aren't transferable, but you've obviously right. broken that mold. So, so you went from chickens, you went from fuel additives. What made you, were you just looking for a business you thought you could grow and you know you didn't really care what industry it was in? Is that why? I was looking for a direct selling uh, business, a consumer products business that I could own okay. versus running for somebody else. And um, that company was already in business. It's called Oxyfresh, O-X-Y-F-R-E-S-H.com. Okay. It was already in business for a couple of years. It was a mess as a company, but it had a, a couple of really interesting products that uh, worked in the marketplace. So I was looking for that. The owners were looking to get out of it. Um, so I bought it and ran it for 35 it years. Around. Yeah. Four years ago, I... I sold a couple of businesses and and stepped out of that business, hired somebody else to run it. Um, mm -hmm. It's doing better now than when I was running it. So, <laughs> Well, you hired and, the right guy then. Yeah. And so all I've been doing for the last four years is is writing and coaching and speaking. Got it. What were, and what were some of the other businesses that you bought and sold over the years? Uh, a snowmobile rental business, a uh, jet ski rental business, a uh, retreat and resorts business, uh, doing leadership retreats at various resorts. Uh -huh. um, sure. And then another direct sales company that just sold nutrition. I sold that. Okay. And well, you're, a, you're unlike a lot of people I get on the show, you're a real entrepreneur because you're you're doing it. I mean, you're buying and selling businesses. Like I said, I get a lot of people that are really successful in a particular industry and they sell because they think it's time, right? And then they start to write and coach and maybe they buy another business and it just doesn't do as well because they didn't have, they didn't have skills. Now you've never gone to college, right? You, you don't have an MBA or anything like that. It's all self-taught on the street, right? On the job. All, all learned from failure. So even though, you know, the resume, the thing about resumes or whatever the media kit was that you were sent, right? it doesn't feature all of the failures. Yeah. But it could, and it probably should. Well, we're going to talk about them now because we're going to teach the, people. The failures are really, are the only place you learn anything. You don't learn anything from the successes. Every, no. Whenever you're successful, you're like, oh, well, you know. Right, of course. Great, you know? The euphoria. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. You don't learn anything if you're always successful. And then as soon as you hit the failure, you haven't learned anything and then you're screwed. Yeah. If you haven't developed so anything. So I can you share failed, some of those? I've failed forward for 45 years. Right. Oh, well, God. Lessons learned. Yeah. You know, actually, most of the failures that I incurred were in the one business that I still own, that I've owned now for, um, yes, I don't know, 35 years, something like that. Um, you know, if it were not for the failures, I would expect that business would be a billion dollar a year business. Okay. So what were the failures in that business? Oh my gosh. Um, well, one, I suppose you'd consider it a failure. It was certainly a lesson. Lots right. They're always lessons. They're never really failures, right? I refused to raise money and take on partners. Okay. So I bootstrapped the company from day one and, you know, that either works or it doesn't work. So I, I'll say it didn't work. I Did you needed, needed a lot, more capital. Is that why? I needed a lot more capital than I had. And because I didn't have a lot of capital, I ended up playing defense most of the time. Um, you know, defense is when you're playing small, you're, you're not, you know, investing enough money in the right places. And so you're trying to really protect cash flow and protect 
profit. And so you're playing defense, not offense. And, right. you know, then that's, that shows up in who you hire. And that's probably the um, biggest mistake that I made over and over and over again. I learned yeah, hiring is a very difficult thing. Even when yeah. you're good at it, it's very hard. Well, it's a very difficult thing if you're going to hire B and C players. So if you're going to hire B and C players, well, who are B and C players? Well, they're the people that you're hiring because you think they're a bargain. Right. Or you can afford them. Right. And, you know, Jack Welch said it best in the GE way that any company that hires B and C players is really doomed to mediocrity because that's B your population, players, right? Yeah. If, if you pay somebody 10 grand a month and they're a B player and you pay them 10 grand a month because that's really all you're comfortable paying somebody. Right. Well, they're going to cost you 10 grand a month plus maybe a lot more. If you hire an A player at, let's say, 15 grand a month, right? that extra five grand a month may be really hard to stomach. And maybe you might like not even know how you're going to come up with the money to pay them. Right. But if they're an A player, they're going to make you money. Right. They're an investment now. Yeah. So you're going to pay 15 grand a month, but you're going to get 30 back. Yeah. And, you know, it took me a long time to learn that lesson. Um, yeah. It's very know, easy to it, fall into that trap. Well, it is. If you don't have enough money, I mean, it's right. Sitting there going, well, how do I hire this A player? I'd, I don't have enough money. And, um, you know, you might even, you know, I did a lot of my hiring on things like um, whatever those free. Uh, you know, yeah. Like, um, like uh, you're talking about this, the Indeed and yeah, yeah, all monster.com, right? all that stuff. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So versus paying somebody, you know, $30,000 to go find you an A player. Right. Recruiter to go steal somebody. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, that's one lesson I learned a lot. And um, that's a big one. Know, I've definitely I done it myself. actually got it and hired an A player. Well, I got out of the way and, you know, he's done fantastic. Made a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of us are, you run businesses, you're afraid about, you know, bringing other people on, what it's going to do to things. You take on risk and, but you're right. I mean, to grow, sometimes you have to have the capital to invest. And you can't, you can't do it, you know? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, that was two lessons. What other things do you teach people about things to watch for and look for? And that's really what you're doing now, right? You're teaching other people how to be successful in business. Yes, yeah. I am. I, I coach, um, you know, some of my clients own billion dollar companies. Some of them mm -hmm. own you know, small entrepreneurial one person shops. Um, and mostly what I coach people on now is I, the technical term for my coaching style is ontological coach. Okay. Which, what does that mean? Well, yeah. it means state of being. What does that mean? Maybe consider me a mood coach. So if you owned a business, Mitch, and you hired mm -hmm. me to coach you, I wouldn't be telling you how to run your business. I, I probably wouldn't know anything about your business. Right. Um, you know, where do you invest money and what products do you sell and how do you do your marketing? And I'll, I wouldn't be telling you any of that stuff. In fact, by the very nature of my coaching, I, I tell very little and I ask hundreds of questions. And the questions actually illuminate for you the answer because I'm going to ask you a question that you haven't asked yourself probably. And if you have asked yourself that question, you haven't held the space by yourself to answer it. And so what I do is I ask people questions and I hold the space for them to answer it. Yeah. And I hold them accountable to answer it. Yeah. So if, some, if, some, if I ask somebody a question and they say, well, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. Well, you know, what they're trying to do is collapse the space to answer the question because they're right. not comfortable. Avoid the I'm question. Open right. that space back up and say, all right, well, let's get comfortable because we're going to find an answer to this question and I'm going to hold the space for you. So 
if you were comfortable, what would be the answer? And I just keep working with people until they answer the questions. And then in the answers, they discover for themselves the truth. Right. And so if there's some agenda I have, it is getting to the truth. And when it comes to mood, so, you know, let's say maybe you say, well, you know, I need to hire a key player in my business. So I'll ask you a bunch of questions about that which will illuminate what is the mood you're bringing to this hiring project? Are you resentful? Are you worried? Are you contracted, playing small? Are you scared? Mm -hmm. um, are you overwhelmed? Are you stressed? Are you optimistic? Are you empowered? Are you excited? Sure. So, I'm going to find out what the mood is around the project. And then if it's not the mood that's required to get the project done, I'm going to coach you into the mood that's going to get the project done. Okay. That's my style of coaching over telling you, oh, you need to hire a person and you need right. to hire this kind of, I don't know people's businesses. And, you know, sometimes I have ideas that I might share, but I don't even charge for my ideas. They're not worth that much. I charge for the questions and holding right. the space. Right. Well, I mean, that's basically the Socratic method. That's how we've all been taught in law school. No, but I, there was a time I, I went to Cornell, not law school, but undergrad. And the, uh, the biology professor got into an argument with the professor from the law school about teaching methods. And the law professor said, I'll tell you what, I don't know anything about what you do. Let's switch classes one time. Let's see how it goes. And he came in asked all these questions, didn't know anything about biology. He would right. just open the book and say, well, tell me this, tell me that. The kids thought it was the greatest lecture we'd ever had. This yeah. other guy went to the law school. He forget about it. He got eaten alive by these right. students. And it was just being inquisitive and getting the students or the person to right to you're bringing out their answers, like what's inside of them. By the way, if we get cut off suddenly, there's a very large lightning storm passing through. If you hear rumbling and they'll just get back on. But so far, the lights haven't flickered. Uh, um, but yeah, I think I look, I interview and work with a lot of coaches and a lot of consultants, and very few of them get that uh, when it comes to, you know, telling somebody to do something versus helping them do it themselves, basically. I mean, yeah. Well, you most know. coaches actually, their definition of coaching is more mentoring or consulting. Yeah. And so the model there is more, well, this is what I think you should do. Right. Giving advice. And that's not my model. Right, right, right. All right. So, and how many books have you written now? I have written three books. Uh, okay. Two are uh, still in publication. One I think is out of publication. It's like, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago. Okay. Uh, it was called The New Entrepreneurs, Visionaries for the 21st Century. Uh, it was an anthology. An anthology? Is that what you call it? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, there was like, you know, 10 authors. Oh, okay. Um, it was like a, combi a combination of works, different authors? Yeah. Yep. Um, but you were the, still in business at this point, right? You still were actively working in the dental oh, yeah. company. Yeah, the products yep, company. Yep. yep. Um, this book, Mach 2, behind me is... Yeah. Um, that's yeah, probably the most impactful book. I wrote it 25 years ago, 1995. Um, and then I rewrote it about two years ago. And it is about the art of vision, mm -hmm. which is the word that I use for mindset, okay. belief, expectation, um, the art of vision and self-motivation and the connection between the two. Okay. So one of the one of the things that I got from one of my coaches, so I haven't gone to college, but I have spent in the last 35 years, 40 years, I guess, probably $350,000 on the equivalent of perhaps a PhD in personal development. Mm -hmm. And instead of going to classes and learning things, I would hire coaches that would 
coach me on my stories, my beliefs, my paradigms, right. and in relationship to my goals and coach me through a higher and higher and higher level of performance. And so that's my college education. And one of those coaches um, decades ago gave me the distinction between desire and what I call self-motivation. Okay. And because at the time I thought if you and I wanted something bad enough, so you got a lot of entrepreneurs watching this, you know, they want to be successful, right? You want to hit that six figures or seven figures or whatever your goals are. You want it real bad. We know you want it. Right. Of course. Because you launched the business and you're trying real hard and you're investing and you're whatever you're doing. Uh, and, but, but I always thought if you wanted something bad enough, that that would give you the horsepower, the magic, right. the mojo yeah. to manifest it. But it's not enough. No, all it, right. all desire really is, is um, like a GPS. It just points us in a direction and says, I want that. Yeah. But the interesting thing about desire and the language of desire, I want that actually affirms that you don't have it. Good point. So you're affirming, I want that so bad. You're affirming so bad that it's over there and you're over here. Right. And it's like a self-limiting it belief almost, right? It is enough, but you're obviously not enough or you wouldn't be over here. Right. And the way the mind works is it works teleologically in the first person present tense. It, it really adopts, what are you telling it is so now, right now in the moment? Right. And so the difference between, for example, goal setting, I want this and here's my plan for attainment. Yeah. And what I call vision work is vision work affirms that you already have it. Which, you know, it's not comfortable for people because, well, no, that's faking it till you make it. Uh, well, okay, maybe it is. Um, but that's not the point. The point is, hey, we got this thing right here that's worth billions of dollars. Right. <laughs> so I'm not worth billions, but. Well, you wouldn't give neighbor, up your head for very little. So, you you know. My neighbor right out my back door, he actually lives right above me and he's building right in front of me is worth a hundred billion dollars. A hundred billion? A hundred billion dollars. He's all self-made college dropout. Well, isn't Larry that what Ellison. Jeff Bezos is worth? So isn't that making him Jeff Bezos? Uh, Bezos is worth, uh, well, before he got divorced, he right. was worth about 800 billion. Now he's worth about 400 billion. This is Larry Ellison. Oh yeah, no, I know. Uh, yeah. Oracle. Right, right. So what is this worth? Well, it's worth, you know, we already know it's worth four or $500 billion because yeah. there's some human beings walking around the planet that have one of these that used it. They didn't use this. You right. know, this is what I use to cut chickens. Right. Um, they didn't no use brain power. this. Right. You know, yeah. This is what you use as a landscaper. They didn't use this as a bricklayer. They didn't even use this as a surgeon, right? They use this to make hundreds of billions of dollars. So what's this worth? It's worth billions of dollars. Now, I'm not suggesting that everything we are want to pursue in life is about money, but if it's worth billions in money, what's it worth in relationships and fitness and yeah. peace of mind and adventure? This thing, which is not just this thing, right? There's great science that says, what's in our gut is far more intelligent and more powerful than even our subconscious mind. In fact, there's more living organisms, single cell organisms in our gut than there is our brain. But okay. when you combine all of this, right, our mind, our subconscious mind, our spiritual self, our body, our gut, when you combine it all, we're magically worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. Doesn't it make sense that we would learn to master the art and the science of how all of that works so that we could deploy it on our goals. And that's the art and science of vision and self-motivation is 
how does it all work? And one of the ways this all doesn't work is it doesn't work well with goal setting. It doesn't work well with, I want this. Right. I mean, look around the world, right? How many people want to be skinny and rich? Right. Everybody. And right. How's that working? Yeah, uh, no. Not so good. Right. Because I think subconsciously, because, you're like, I want this, but I can't have it. That's what you say subconsciously to yourself. Well, it, it, it can't is one interpretation, but the more profound interpretation is I don't have it. I don't have it. I am not it. Right. And you're, right. you're now attracting whatever it isn't. It's like opposite of what you want to have happen, right? Well, because the way this thing works is it's like, you know, there's fancy terms for it, like cognitive dissonance, but. Uh, well, it vibrational whatever energy. It, you want to whatever whatever it you want. holds as true. Right. It tends to manifest. Yeah. And so if what I hold is true is, well, I want to make seven figures a year. So I obviously don't. What I tend to manifest is that I don't. Right. That you don't, you can't, you won't, you never will. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you look at people in the extreme that are negative and that, you know, that it's just, they bring everybody down. They, they attract negative emotions and negative energy and the people that are really up and, you know, have positive attitudes and believe it can be done and don't even think twice about it. They reach the, the star. I mean, you, have you met anybody who's worth a hundred billion dollars who is generally negative about their ability to achieve anything in life doesn't exist. Right. Cause they would have never gotten there. No, not, not, I mean, not unless they, you know, inherited it or. Right. Um, different, but then they'll lose it in a couple of generations. Probably. Yeah. I mean, there's always exceptions, right? You there's don't always exceptions. Model yourself after exceptions. You want to model yourself after the rule. Right. 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 And the real secret science that is in this book, uh, Mitch is, you know, the way we've been taught to even goal set or even visualize stuff is, you know, figure out what the end game is. Okay. You know, I, you know, I want to lose 20 pounds. I right. Want... See yourself like this, right? Yeah, yeah. You want, so the whole thing is, well, what's the end game? What's the, what's the vision at the end? And that's really, if that's the way you pursue it, that's also going to really be a struggle for you because the secret sauce is you want to figure out what the end game is. Like, who do you want to be? What do you want to have? Where do you want to go? All that. You want the end game. And of course you can keep changing that and updating it and moving the target. Yeah, should all be a moving want. target, right? Keep yeah. doing that. But the secret is you want to figure out what do I need to do every day? Right. And who do I need to be? Yeah. I think attitude and beliefs. Yeah, and living in the, the now more, right? Yes, because, you know, let's say, for example, you want to lose 20 pounds. Okay, well, that's great. But if that's the only vision you have, you're going to really struggle. The secret sauce is, what's the strategy for losing 120 pounds or 20 pounds? Right. Well, uh, you know, we'll keep it simple, right? So how about, you know, hydrate probably three times more than you do now. Right. How about, you know, break a sweat a couple of times a day. Right. For, you know, 30 minutes or so. Right. You don't have to start bodybuilding at seven hours a day, eating special protein stuff. You're never going to, there's no, no connection no, no. between where you want to be. Right. Well, it, let me finish. So, uh, you know, what you want to do is find these basic, simple strategies like, okay, eating fresh and clean and reduce calories, breaking a sweat, hydrate. Okay. Yeah. There's just three basic strategies. So if you want to lose 20 pounds, have a vision about losing 20 pounds. That's great. You know, you and the new clothes and buff and blah, 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 all that kind of great stuff. But the real vision you want to have is the vision of you working out every day right. and the vision of you eating a different way every day and a vision of you hydrating differently every day. You want to have that vision. That's right. what you want to see yourself doing over and over and over and over again and then get in the habit of working out, which takes space repetition for a month or two. Get right. in the habit of eating right. Get in the habit of hydrating. And guess what? what? What happens over some period of time when the habit kicks in is then identity kicks in. And identity is the real tipping point. Identity is like this. So how do you see yourself now? Let's say you're overweight. How do you see yourself relative to working out? Well, most people's identity around working out, if they're overweight, is I don't like working out. 
Right. That's their identity. Yeah. You want to change that to, I work out. That's your identity. Right. I hydrate. I eat fresh. That's me. You know, it's kind of like. Right. And the weight loss is the, is the result, right? Yes. It's not, it's not the, the goal. The goal well, is to be living healthy. Well, if you make the vision like the micro visions, if you make the vision, the single daily actions that are required and the identity, then the big goal, the end game is just automatic. It's a yeah. slam dunk. Yeah. You can just bank on it because what you've done is fallen in love with the process. And yeah, put all these things in motion. Yeah. So what I it's teach people to do is, you know, forget about discipline and commitment. Those are BS concepts that are really designed for people who don't want to do what needs to be done. And if you don't want to do what needs to be done, no amount of discipline and commitment is going to keep you doing it for the next two years. Right. You're eventually going to, you know, you get know, worn out setting and yourself give up. up. Right. Instead of being disciplined and committed, how about fall in love with doing what you need to do? Yeah. Because if yeah. you if you are a fitness person, if you are a sweat breaker, you will work out every day. Why? Because it's your who life. you are. Yeah, it's who you are. It's it's what you love to do. Yeah. And that's what I teach people to motivate themselves around is focusing on what are the the repetitive strategies? Maybe they're not everyday strategies but most often they are. But what are the everyday repetitive strategies that you need to start seeing yourself as and falling in love with and doing every day so that you eventually achieve whatever end game you have in mind? And when you get motivated around those single daily actions and those identities, success just becomes kind of natural and organic and progressive and not a big grind or a big hustle or a price to pay or work you have to do to get there. That's a paradigm I smash. Yeah, well, because you're going to fall off the wagon eventually because you don't like it. Right. Right. It's like, uh, what's that Japanese concept? Kaizen? Kaizen. Kaizen, right? Little changes mean Constant because we can't, you know, oh my God, you can't as human beings, we can't deal with wholesale changes, big things in our life. It's too disruptive. We could deal with going to the gym 15 minutes a day, building up to it. Like you said, starting to become addicted to working out and eating clean versus eating Twizzlers on the weekends. Right. I don't know, whatever you're doing. And right. yeah, I see you see it all the time. I do too. Business is kind of the same way. You know, people are running their businesses. They're struggling. They can't, change things overnight either they just won't yeah. they won't maintain it and all businesses generally rise and fall on new business development so you got a lot of entrepreneurs watching this show probably the thing that'll change everything for you is how many people every day are you asking to take a look at what are you selling yeah and you know whatever method that is you know it could be you know, knocking on doors, it could be phone calls, it could be social media connections, it could be emails, however you do it, it doesn't really matter. The what matters is how often do you do it? How many right. people do you do it with? And what's the attitude you have when you're doing it? And so I could take just about any business person, you know, mortgage broker, realtor, car salesman, network marketer, um, brick and mortar person and just ask them a few questions about, you know, how do you raise the revenue in this business and yeah. who, who raises the revenue and what's the process for getting in front of those people and how many people do you need to talk to before somebody says yes to your process? Okay. Well, how many of those people are you talking to every day now? And most people won't even know. They don't track it. Right. So let's, okay, well, let's start tracking it. Okay. What we find out is, well, you're on average talking to one person a day and you're making, you know, I know one a day is, you know, it's not a good analogy for a lot of businesses, but it, you just right. adopt it to your business folks, whatever it is. 
your new business development single daily action if you are keeping track let's say is one a day and what would happen if you just went to two right doubles it right and the the things that keep people from doing that is number one they're not keeping track to begin with right so they don't even have sort of that self accountability that self coaching mechanism of knowing clearly whether they're on track or off track right because they're not checking the boxes every day yeah and you know one of the most powerful coaches in the world is just to have an eight and a half by 11 calendar of the month on your wall and whatever you need to do every day to crush it check the box on that day if you did it today and people that do that they can just look at that calendar and they can know exactly where they're at in the month. Yeah. Right. And people that don't do that, they can fool themselves into thinking, you know, one of the things, you know, I ask people when I'm coaching them, if it's, if they, if they know, you know, something about their business development is, you know, well, you know, how's your prospecting going? And, you know, the most common answer is, well, I could do better. What, what they're telling me is they have no idea how many people they're talking to because they're not keeping track of it. Right. You know, how's your prospecting? Oh, pretty good. They're not keeping track. No. You know, if I ask somebody who's keeping track how their new business development is, they're going to pull out the stat tracker. And yeah. they're going to give me a number. And if yeah, you don't give me know. a number, I know you're not keeping track. And if you're not keeping track, you're not even in the game. Right. Like you are a total amateur that does not deserve to be successful. Yeah. And you won't. Right. No, because it's not but rocket start, science, but people don't do it. No, they don't do it because right. they think they can get away with not doing it. You know, one of the things that they entrepreneurs don't, face it. don't lack is, you know, moxie, right? They got plenty of moxie. Like yeah. nobody's questioning your courage. Right. right. <laughs> but that doesn't help if you're not, you don't know what's going on and how to right. improve it. Right. Yeah. 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 No, I, it's look, I, I think it's all, it all makes sense. And, and the things that I see people doing and not doing, it's you scratch your head. Like, what, what do you mean? You can do that. Like there's never, is there anything that you, what's the word that you successful people do the things that unsuccessful people are unwilling to do. Not right. that they can't, but of course that's why, guys who are successful like you can go out and help people because they can't help themselves. That's why people come up with weight loss clinics because they can't do it themselves. Well, you know, people just their own worst enemy. You know, everything you and I want to do in life, we're going to do on our own right up to whatever our ability is. And our ability is going to be based on our vision, our beliefs, our limiting beliefs, self-esteem, the stories we believe, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, Hey, audience, if you've been running a business or building a business for, let's say, two, three, four years, and you've plateaued, what does that mean? It means that you have built that business up to the your innate ability. Right. And if you want it to be twice as big, you don't need to work harder. You don't need to be more disciplined or more committed. The, the fastest way to double your business is go attach yourself to somebody that will lift your lid, right? That will change your stories that will make you a bigger, better leader of the business. And then the business grows up to that level. And sometimes you hire a coach that will double your business, but that coach doesn't have the coaching ability to 10 X your business, right? Then you got to go to the next level, right? And coaching, I mean, just think of it like, you know, if you want to train for the Olympics, if you want to win a gold medal at the Olympics and you're, I don't know, a pole vaulter, a swimmer, a tennis player or whatever, and you just go out on the court with your own innate ability, is that going to win you a gold medal? No way. No. No. So if you want to win a gold medal, what's the first thing you do? You hire a good coach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no professional athletes, high performing individuals that don't have coaches. There's none. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, look at a look at a professional golfer today. I mean, they got a whole herd of people. Oh yeah. Following them around. Somebody they have coaches a, them right. They have a coach stro- a stroke for the coach for their mental game for their physical yeah. conditioning All for their the nutrition. Stuff. Yep. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Now, how? So here's a good question. So you you 
made a transition out of your business to writing and coaching and motivating and stuff like that? How do you grow your business? How do you, I mean, you don't have to anymore, but how do you prospect and um, bring clients onto your business? Well, I do a lot of different things to bring new clients uh, into my business, including higher coaches. Right. Um, you know, I have a coach on my team right now that I pay $10,000 a month just to coach me on new business development. There's a lot of things like he doesn't coach me on delivering content. Uh, right now, I, I don't need anybody to, to deliver, to coach me on delivering content. My content is billion dollar content. My content's awesome. I would put my content up against anybody in the universe that delivers content. Right. My, but you do have professionals marketing. you pay to get it out there, right? Well, my marketing is um, sucks, basically. <laughs> right? And you know why? Because innately, I'm a lousy marketer. That's just not... That's not your bailiwick. So it's not your wheelhouse. It isn't, but yeah. hey, if you want to be in business, you got to market, right? So... I just keep hiring people, you know, some of them are 2000 a month, some of them are five grand a month. Uh, this current one that I've had for the last six months, awesome guy, super smart, way smarter than me. Um, he asks lots of questions. He also makes suggestions. So I'd say he's, you know, half coach, half strategist. Okay. Um, but he's 10 grand a month. And so you know, how do I do business development? I mean, I probably got, you know, 20 different strategies. Yeah. And sometimes each of them requires a different coach. Yeah. So I put, I invest a lot. I probably invest 50% of my revenue back in growing the business. Makes sense. As opposed to pulling it off the table. And right. I see that you know, one of the mistakes that I see entrepreneurs make is they're an entrepreneur, they own a business, but the way they think about their income is like an employee. Right. So very much if so. they get, for example, commissions, or if they get revenue of, you know, what, let's say, you know, $30,000 a month, they think that's their income. Right. They think they make 360 a year. Right. Which... <laughs> No, that's your revenue. Right. And even if you don't have any employees, if you want that revenue to grow, if you even want that revenue to maintain, you better be asking the question, what percentage of that are you willing to reinvest in growth? Yeah. And then ask the question, okay, let's say it's 20%. Where do I invest it? So if you had $6,000, if you make 30 grand a month, that's your revenue and you think it's your income, you know, what if you invested $6,000 a month in growing it? What would you invest in? I don't know, but I know the questions to ask and keep asking. Right. And so just that paradigm shift alone, that your revenue is not your income, not if you want to keep growing. Right. Right. And you're probably already working as hard as you can possibly work, right? I haven't met too many entrepreneurs that, well, you know, yeah. uh, my income's <laughs> flat. And I really want to double my income. And I've been working at this for, you know, about three years and it's still flat. Well, you know, how many hours a day do you work? Oh, about three. Nice. <laughs> how many days a week do you work? Yeah, about three. Well, you, you could work harder, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah, I could work harder. Yeah, that's. Everybody I talk to is already working as hard as they can Right. Work. They're working six, seven days a week. When you become an entrepreneur, you don't work less. No. It's part of your life now. Yeah. Now you could, right? You could. Well, at you some know, point you want to, right? Well, that's part of my model that I, I have a coach. I have another coach uh, just for how do I make more money every year and work less and less and less? So That's a good coach to have. My model right now is I work from about 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. four days a week. And sometimes I work till noon and sometimes I even do stuff in the afternoon. But ideally, 
you know, I want to work from about 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., three or four days a week. That would be and ideal. Make, and make more money every year. Yeah. Why? That's, because for me, it's not just about money. Yeah, it's about quality uh, of life, right? It's about quality of life. You know, Especially you're in Hawaii. You, you don't want to miss all that stuff. My wife. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. What's that? Uh, what's that book? The the four hour work week, or is it the four yeah. hour work day? No, it's the four hour work week. Four hour work week. You know, Tim yeah. Ferriss. He he invented the the concept, and um, you know, it's a great idea, right? So yeah. Well, you there's, know, there's a lot of people I know that work six days a week, but if they really added the actual time they spent working instead of wasting all the time, they probably only work four hours anyway. So, well, there's also Parkinson's law, which says that we tend to fill up whatever time we allot to right. get something done. Correct. So yeah. if the way you see work is, oh, I work 12 hours a day. I'm gonna, I've started at seven and I'm going right. to end at seven or I start at 10 and I'm going to start at- going to take you all day to do whatever you're doing. Right. But yeah. if you set it up, so you know what? You've only got two hours a day to get it all done. Parkinson's law says right. you will fit it in to the time allotted. You will either expand the work to fit the great big time that you have allotted, yeah. or you will compress yeah. the work and get it done. Get it in the time allotted. It's like, you know, when you're going on vacation and you're in the last day and you only got four hours because you got to get to the, 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 you know, the airport or whatever, you get everything done. Now, you don't want to leave yeah. anything on your desk. You, yeah, it's all taken care of. Yeah. That's so true. It's yep. so true. Um, I can't thank you enough for spending the time. I know it's, I'm cutting into your day, which ends in about uh, 20 minutes, I think. <laughs> and, uh, and I appreciate it uh, coming on the show. Uh, in the show notes, I guess we'll put links to your website and your social media accounts. What's the best way if people want to learn about you and learn from you? What's the best way for them to interact with you? My website and social media. My website is richardbrook.com. With an E, right? K E. Yeah. Uh, and on social media, everything, I'm Richard Blissbrook, B L I S S, which is really my middle name. It's your middle name. It's not your, your state of being. It is my state of being, but it's my, <laughs> actually my middle name. It's my grandmother's maiden name, which is. Oh, got it. Okay. Well, Richard, I can't thank you enough on a Friday when it's. Uh, a storm now in my place um enjoy yourself in hawaii and have a good weekend and uh again i'll let you know when when this episode is going to come out cool thank you mitch